Welcome to uh, the third plenary session. We have another exciting session for you uh, on the aggregation of uh, beliefs, and in particular on a forecasting tournament that was launched uh, by IARPA uh, a few years back. And we'll hear from, uh, initially from Jason uh, Matheny uh, from IARPA. Uh, he's a program manager there, and he'll describe uh, the, the tournament. And then we'll hear from a couple of folks who participated in that tournament after that. So let me turn it over. Uh, thanks very much. Um, you know, uh, IARPA is uh, uh, the DARPA for uh, the intelligence community. Um, and it's, it's um, uh, rare that the intelligence community is credited with possessing collective intelligence. Um, so I really appreciate the, the charitable invitation to be here. I'm hoping that some of it will, will rub off on us. Um, we've, for the past few years, run a series of, of forecasting tournaments. Uh, some of which have involved human judgments um, and crowdsourced human judgments, and some of which have involved uh, making sense of collective behavior uh, within societies through sort of the, the digital exhaust given off um, by, uh, uh, by uh, 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 members of society. Um, all done open source, all, um, all openly published. Um, I'm really the... Um, uh, the lead-in uh, to uh, two uh, presentations following me, and then as well as uh, some poster presentations that I hope you saw um, either today or you'll see tomorrow. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about why we've organized uh, forecasting tournaments. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it was sort of a risky move on our part because... Um, uh, it's hard to get uh, social scientists uh, and sometimes computer scientists to put their necks on the line to make forecasts about real-world events. Um, and uh, I know at least when, uh, when I was doing research, uh, I much preferred to, uh, to forecast history. Um, <laughs> it was easier. It was more satisfying. I usually got it right. Uh, uh, but but with, with these programs, we were interested in really testing the limits of what we could forecast in, in societal events uh, and seeing where things break. So with, uh, with four programs of the last uh, three and a half years or so, uh, we've tried to find those limits. And with, in some cases, such as economic events, we quickly found those, those limits and um, and, and sort of um, bl blamed ourselves for having the hubris to think we could beat you know, Goldman Sachs uh, with, um, with a lot of you know, undergrad and, and, and grad student effort powered by uh, Red Bull and, and pizza. Um, and you know, despite our best efforts, we were not able to make accurate economic forecasts. But over the last uh, three years, I think we have um, made a lot of progress in, in forecasting other types of events including geopolitical events like uh, uh, elections or uh, uh, protests, um, uh, humanitarian crises, uh, as well as science and technology events, the emergence of new scientific communities, the uh, applications of technologies, uh, social and public health events. So we're making much more accurate forecasts of uh, flu and cholera and hantavirus and other diseases. Um, and we hope to have more uh, tournaments to, to come. Uh, and there are opportunities to, for all of you to participate in this, uh, which we'd be grateful for, and I'll talk about at the end. Um, so there, there are a few reasons why we're interested in forecasting in general. Um, I hope to live most of my life in the future. Um, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> I... Uh, and uh, I think you know that's that's true for uh, for countries as well. So for for policymakers and other decision makers within nations, uh, who most of um, most of whom are are forced to make decisions that have effects uh, on um, on on some future state of the world, uh, they're very interested both in understanding the the effects of doing nothing and the effects of making particular decisions. Uh, so we've been interested particularly in forecasts that are conditional upon some sort of policy action. Uh, another reason uh, to be interested in, in forecasting uh, is because they're really strong tests of, of, of theories. Um, so, you know, and Popper was sort of convinced that this is the test of a scientific theory. Um, and I, I think one, one thing that we've found um, unsettling about running a forecasting tournament is that uh, we at IARPA 
are really forced to be honest with ourselves about what works. So uh, there's no way for me to lie to my boss uh, that we correctly you know, forecasted a Colombian election if we really didn't forecast the Colombian election. Uh, he can call me on that. So it's a, it's a way really of, um, of maintaining the credibility of, of the science and of our investments in the science uh, in a way that we, we can't overfit to data. Uh, we can't fool ourselves into thinking that we have a theory that works when it doesn't. Uh, the third is that, um, the third reason to, to be interested in forecasting is that it's, it's, um, it's fun. You can, you can treat it as uh, a collective sport. And the competitive aspect uh, of, of this sort of forecasting in a tournament uh, really does help to recruit very large numbers of, of participants. Um, uh, um, or we can recruit uh, machine learning algorithms. We found that those are easier to get through IRBs. Um, and that, that, that kind of, um, that activity really helps to organize these virtual laboratories for doing lots of fundamental research on uh, human judgment uh, or say on ensemble learning in the case of our, our automated approaches. Um, so I'm gonna talk first about uh, one of our programs which has been going for uh, a little over uh, three years, um, which, uh, which Lyle and Van will talk about in, in more detail. Uh, the the uh, conceit of this program was if we, uh, if we look at the way in which the intelligence community today generates forecasts, um, it's inconsistent with most of what we know about uh, good human judgment from the past 50 years of research. Right now, we get um, either individual experts, individual intelligence analysts, or small groups of deliberating analysts who have to reach consensus uh, about a judgment in order for it to be published. Um, so we, we thought that we could improve upon uh, the current state of, of forecasting in the intelligence community by taking some of what we know already um, about, about human judgment and ex extending that. Uh, and we thought um, a useful way of, of testing uh, new methods would be to see how well they perform against forecasting real world events in real time. Uh, so we've, we've focused on methods that, that aggregate human judgments, and um, in the last three years, uh, we've uh, collected uh, over a million judgments about uh, real-world events and scored them for, for accuracy. Um, and there's, there's a, a good reason for aggregating judgments, um, uh, some of which you've, you've heard already today. Uh, one is that relevant knowledge is widely distributed across communities. A second is that if you have large numbers of judgments, uh, you can cancel out some of the random error. Uh, and a third is that if you have independence of judgments, you can cancel out some of the systematic bias. Um, so this may not be the best way of making a forecast, but it's, it's dependable. Um, it, might, it might follow the maxi poc rule of maximizing the probability of an okay outcome. Uh, so we've been interested in these sorts of aggregative methods, and there was some past research to suggest that uh, aggregative methods like uh, 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 unweighted surveys and prediction markets uh, do really well, especially compared to uh, individual experts or uh, unstructured groups. Um, so we were, we were first interested in are there ways of uh, improving uh, prediction markets uh, and the unweighted average uh, so that they, um, they can beat their, their sort of vanilla form. Um, so we, we looked for, for some past research that suggests that if you, if you have information about the participants um, that use uh, these methods, uh, and you have some information about their judgments over time, you can actually improve the accuracy of uh, the average um, or median or some other uh, um, a measure of central tendency for these judgments and uh, prediction markets too, you might be able to improve by using more detailed information. Um, so we were interested in, in ways of, um, of beating uh, the vanilla uh, unweighted average and prediction market by uh, using more detailed information. Um, so this was a hard case to make internally uh, at first. Um, there was uh, there was some resistance to the idea of uh, crowdsourcing geopolitical forecasts uh, for the intelligence community, uh, but we were lucky enough to have at least one ally with a, a Nobel Prize, which I recommend uh, whenever you can. 
Um, and it was nice that you know, there were some standout quotes uh, that we could put in you know, boldface uh, in our uh, recommendation memos for funding. Um, so having, having some uh, then support from the research community, um, and it's also helpful if, um, if, uh, if those Nobel laureates um, publish popular books that can be read by uh, intelligence analysts. Um, it, it did help make the case for, for funding research on, uh, on this program. Um, so the, the idea was, well, let's find ways in which we can elicit forecasts in real time from a range of analysts so that decision makers wouldn't have to wait for a group of analysts to come to consensus, write a product, have that product coordinated and re-edited and then provided to a decision maker some weeks or months later. Let's find a way for a a decision maker to post a question directly to a system uh, and then be able to track how judgments are changing over time uh, across a community of thousands of analysts uh, and see sort of how the, the, um, the pulse of the community changes. Uh, you know, what's uh, measuring the anxiety level uh, of analysts in real time, uh, looking for inflection points where analysts seem to be becoming more anxious and maybe also providing the ability to look at a cross-section of analysts and how their, uh, their views differ. Um, also finding ways of, of rewarding accuracy and rewarding dissent. Uh, as prediction markets do, um, if you're um, a fly in the ointment and you're an accurate fly, uh, you get more points. Um, so we thought that was a good principle to follow. Um, so we uh, we're interested as well in how the um, individual differences in, um, in uh, analysts uh, may explain some of the variance in forecasting accuracy. Uh, so we wanted to ensure that a research program that we had in this area uh, could include some information about the participants and look for those correlates that, uh, of, of uh, forecasting accuracy that predicted performance. Um, so we uh, put out a call for proposals. We got uh, five research teams that we decided to fund from their strong proposals. And over the last three years, they've collected over a million judgments from more than 10,000 uh, research volunteers. Uh, and now I think the number is closer to 20,000. Um, we've evaluated them using real events, the sorts of events that you would read about in the news. Um, and then we've tested many methods. Our, our, uh, our funded teams have tested many methods, including uh, ways of, of weighting uh, probabilities that are given by uh, by participants, uh, prediction markets that are combinatorial in design, uh, uh, which uh, GMU has pursued, um, auto traders within prediction markets. So can you combine human judgments and statistical models? Uh, Bayesian true serum, a, uh, a method that was developed here at, at MIT by Drajan Freilek, uh, the Delphi methods, uh, judgmental bootstrapping, decomposition, and a, a range of others. And then we compared to benchmarks, including uh, regular surveys, regular prediction markets, uh, deliberating experts, and our own internal intelligence assessments. Uh, we, we funded these five teams knowing that the uh, bulk of work would certainly be done by undergrads and grad students, um, again, with the Red Bull and the pizza, but understanding, too, that this would require um, depth into uh, recruiting and retaining very large numbers of participants who are deeply engaged in, um, in this forecasting. It's hard work, um, uh, and I, I think you'll hear from Lyle about some of the efforts that it's taken to retain these. And then we have a valuation team of an FFRDC, a sort of third party uh, who's not really beholden uh, to the government uh, and can, can tell us when we're being stupid. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to steal the thunder of, of Lyle or Van, who will talk about uh, the results. Um, but it's, it's really, I think, um, something we're, we're proud of. And I think for, for people like me who are originally skeptical of, of being able to make uh, better judgments about extremely complex phenomena, uh, like geopolitical events, um, it's encouraging. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there's a, there's a, um, uh, a Niels Bohr line about how um, uh, imagine how much harder physics would be if electrons could think. <laughs> and here, I, I, there's, there's at least some sign that 
um, uh, millions of thinking electrons do have some forms of, of behavior uh, that, are, that are collectively uh, predictable uh, in ways that are useful to decision making. Uh, one benefit of doing unclassified research in the open uh, is that you can uh, get press coverage, uh, which also means you get more research participants. Um, I think the uh, NPR story alone um, uh, probably brought in several thousand new uh, volunteers. Um, we uh, encourage our research teams to publish fully and on uh, the IARPA website, you can find a Google Scholar link uh, to all of the uh, work that's come out of, uh, out of the program. So when we, um, when we first funded uh, ACE, uh, there was a, um, a large group of us at IARPA who wanted to apply uh, this general approach right away to science and technology, uh, to forecasting, um, say, technological milestones particularly in the fields that we were interested in. Um, and I think there were two reasons for this. First, a lot of us are technological determinists who think that um, a lot of these important uh, events that we care about in the world uh, will be determined in large part by technological innovations. Um, and the second reason was that we're nerds and we want to know what the um, nice gadget will be that we should have uh, sooner than everybody else. Um, so we, we started a new research program to, um, uh, to forecast science and technology using a prediction market that, uh, that GMU had developed. Uh, and we used the same general approach of having a, a forecasting tournament in which GMU has been responsible for submitting you know, daily forecasts uh, of uh, scientific and uh, technical uh, events. Um, the questions themselves, it turned out, was something we needed to crowdsource. Uh, so we wanted to scale up the work that we had done in ACE so that we had hundreds, up to 1,000 of concurrent uh, forecasting questions. Uh, and instead of you know, having just a few thousand uh, forecasters, we might have 10,000 or more um, because these, uh, these S&T topics can get fairly esoteric, so we, we need a lot of coverage. Um, it was simply impractical for um, either um, GMU or for IARPA uh, to generate that many questions. So we, um, uh, we uh, um, funded GMU to develop a system for crowdsourcing that. In addition, we leveraged some work that was done elsewhere at IARPA to uh, uh, find indicators in the scientific and technical literature automatically uh, that could help yield interesting um, questions. Uh, GMU built a website with Inkling and, and some of their other partners called SciCast.org, um, and it's a combinatorial market that allows you to look at the relationships between questions. Here's the teaming structure. Uh, Fuse teams are the ones generating these automated questions, and then GMU uh, with their subcontractors is leading the SciCast. It's, um, got a kind of attractive website with you know, retro graphics and you go in and there's a time series of forecasts for uh, S&T questions for I think right now about 500 of them. Um, and you, you know, the, the, the spikes correlate with events, whether you know, it's Iceland uh, speculating about the adoption of, of Bitcoin uh, or some other events. Um, uh, and if you think you know, the probability is wrong on the top 500 question, uh, you can go in and edit it um, and win highly coveted Amazon gift cards in the process. Uh, so we'll, we'll find out if, if this is right soon. Um, so one of the things we were interested in was a tenfold speed up in combinatorial market performance. Um, I definitely encourage you to check out the poster, I think, at uh, slot 42 on, um, on, on some of the combo market design. Uh, broad global uh, participation from scientists uh, and the rest of stuff that you can read here. Um, we've been evaluating these questions um, uh, the same way we have in, in ACE and comparing them to other benchmarks that exist. Uh, but it's a, it's a relatively new program. Uh, and one disadvantage of uh, having a forecasting 
tournament is that you have to actually wait for the future to happen uh, to evaluate re your results. It's, it's really inconvenient uh, that way. Um, there are a few things just to wrap up. Um, you know, um, I would give a plug for the Good Judgment Project for you to participate, but since they have something like 20,000 participants, I don't think Lyle needs the help uh, in having any more participants. Um, SciCast, uh, we definitely need more uh, scientists and engineers to participate uh, at, at any level um, in, in schooling or um, preschooling even. Um, so please, uh, if you're um, interested in S&T topics, uh, sign up and uh, correct the forecast that we have wrong. Uh, why forecast? Uh, to make um, our collective intelligence better about these important topics, uh, to earn bragging rights, uh, and to, again, win those highly coveted Amazon gift cards, um, uh, which, we, um, uh, which could be then spent uh, subsequently um, on any number of uh, SciCast swag items <laughs> that I'm sure you're planning to put on Amazon. Uh, we have more tournaments to come, and we're always looking for ideas for new tournaments uh, that we can either leverage uh, crowd judgments um, or uh, um, uh, crowd sensing. Um, we are also interested in other research ideas. Uh, so most of us at IARPA came uh, from academia or from industry. Uh, if you have ideas of your own that you want to launch a program for, I can think of no better way of having a multiplier effect uh, than going to a place where you can help to fund uh, 100 scientists who um, care about uh, your topic uh, and want to work on it. Uh, so please email me if you're interested. Thank you.